Howdy folks, Brian Cusco here at Triple B. Welcome back to the most professional channel on YouTube. No, that's not a fact, I made it up. We're just making it up as we go along. Welcome back to the Herpeton Talks. You're wondering how many of these Herpeton Talks do you have up your sleeve, Brian? Wouldn't you like to know? You're just gonna have to keep watching to find out. This week, we have Mr. Brett Baldwin giving us a talk on Ethiopian vipers. And he's got lots of nice slides. You can see pictures of the vipers as well. And it should be a good learning experience for everybody. You're watching Triple B TV. So I know everybody has seen uh, Ethiopian mountain vipers. It's a picture, heard about them somewhere, maybe seen them in a zoo. But they're just, they're the most beautiful snake that I've ever seen, I think. Um, and become one of my favorites. Um, not much is known about them, still, uh, after a, I mean, quite a few years in captivity now. But we've got a lot of information here, I think, that is probably new and hasn't been published yet, at least that I've seen. I know there's a lot of Europeans uh, that have them, and they've been reproducing them in captivity. But still, the publications on them are, are scarce. So this is one of our exhibits. Uh, our own, well, our exhibit at the zoo for Ethiopian mountain vipers. Uh, they're a, a four by four by four uh, ex exhibit cube. They're uh, in, located in the main reptile house. They're original, so the original being that they are part of the FDR Works project from 1935-36. So it's a historical building, and this is most of Balboa Park. So. It will be there forever. We, we work with the insides of the exhibits. We can do uh, inside work, replace exhibits, but not the, anything structural. So we, these cubes we do, uh, they've served well over the years. So they're first described in 1977, and they're still only known from a few localities. Uh, there's people doing work with them now, but the publications and the information gradually slips out. Uh, but they're again, they're they're from uh, uh, the highlands of Ethiopia, so uh, they're from 1,700 to 2,800 meters, uh, roughly 5,600 to 9,200 feet. Um, so some specific localities being Goba, Robe, Dinsho, Dobala, and there's probably many other areas or places where they're found uh, in this range. Uh, they're medium size snake. They're, they're pretty chunky, as in like a puff adder size, um, th three to three and a half feet. Uh, males are um, noticeably smaller than the females. I've we'll got some pictures of that difference um, we'll go through. Um, these early uh, known localities were co uh, coffee fields, um, which is pretty interesting that to how, how big these coffee plantations are, and co co Arabica has been coming out of there for forever, and um, I'm sure they've been seeing them over the years, but to have seen them to be described in 1977 is, is pretty interesting, I think. Um, but also, with the coffee plantations being so expansive, it's starting to change the climate there in the region, that region of Ethiopia, so they're even talking about moving coffee plantations to a higher elevation because if they can't move it lower, the, the beans won't work. They're not listed under um, IUCN yet because there's, there's not enough really known about them to, to put them on the list. So this is kind of a rough uh, uh, localities uh, that are known, these, this region on the eastern side of the rift and then the western side of the rift valley that runs through here. Uh, this range, is, it probably is much bigger, but there's dotted, I'll sh there'll be another slide coming up that shows more specific localities, but, but I'm sure that it, they're much broader than this. The circles you see is the, the puff adders that, that occur there. Um, they're not, so, not as much in the higher elevations, although there have been reports of them being there. They're not supposed to be in higher elevations, but they, there's, there's known uh, uh, localities of them occurring where parviocula occur also are the Ethiopian mountain viper. Uh, and then the triangles is the, the parviocula, the known localities for them, which here, this, this here, um, let's see, the star is, is 
that's a listing we'll get to later for a new species, uh, Herena, but I'll get to that later. But here is where there's a known locality of puff adders and uh, Parviacula, and then over here are the triangles of the of Parviacula. So mostly on the west side, but I'm sure there's there's more of them on the east side of the Rift Valley. And this is some typical habitat. Um, these are pretty interesting. The, the Lobelia, uh, Rhecopatellum, is uh, a pretty interesting plant. It also, the Lobelia gro grows in Hawaii. You, you look it up and you can see the, the, how similar they are. But they only occur up here in, in Africa and uh, Ethiopia and the Highlands. So here's some uh, coffee plantation picture, uh, typical of the area. And then a little broader out. Uh, these are some temperatures that we uh, we started out with early on, um, just based on the Mishoktu Lake, which is an area where we, they are known to be from. So we use these temperatures to set them up um, initially. We change them a little bit over time. Uh, this is currently how we have them set up, but we also have them in uh, in what we call our cool room, our cool section, where we have um, main mountain vipers also. So although the, the habitats are different, but the climates are fairly similar. So for a while we had them cooling down um, as much as we could, but it, um, over, we put, implemented a, a new uh, AC, HVAC system that would allow us to get temperatures down into the 50s. So then we moved them into there a few years back. So that system is now um, where we keep uh, the Mang Mountain Vipers and the Ethiopian Vipers. So this is where we are now. We haven't gotten through. We're still running these temperatures and we'll continue to increase them a little bit. Uh, here's one of the larger enclosures that we have them in. These were initially built for uh, heliderms, or they were specifically Guatemalan uh, uh, beaded lizards. And they worked pretty well for those. And, and here, there's uh, chambers, there's large openings here, they can go down and there's boxes there. Uh, the snakes can utilize that, they come in and out um, on either end. It's about 16 inches from the screen to this rock here, and the temperatures here can get to be 98 to 100, 101 degrees there, but the females will bask um, for long periods of time there. But they have a they can uh, move out. There's gradient, uh, huge uh, temperature gradients here. It could be uh, 68 degrees or 65 degrees down here, and then uh, so they can move in and out. And also the temperatures overnight uh, are change. So these are some uh, enclosures for some of the smaller ones that we, that we have right now, uh, from 2014 babies and 2015 babies, and they grow really fast. And they eat like crazy. Um, they can, they'll eat every week. Um, there's these are fairly new in, enclosures that we we had made, so we took a bunch of different designs and kind of combined them to to this this um, design here. There's cutouts in the back so the lights can be lower, and the screens are stainless and they're doubled because there's venomous animals in there. And here's the section that we have the both main shim vipers and the Ethiopian vipers in. Uh, the the Mangshim vipers are in this exhibit here. It's, it's pretty large. You can walk inside it. But this corridor, uh, this is the new air conditioning system we have. But above all the exhibits here, this is the back of the exhibit, so the public side is over here. Um, there's skylights above that we can open, uh, which is really nice throughout the building. And so uh, if there's barometric pressure changes, uh, uh, temperature changes overnights are much different than the daytimes. We utilize the skylights a lot and it's, it works out really well. So there's the skylights on the roof and then from, uh, the, from uh, inside the building. So like with Betus, uh, most Betus, it's pretty easy to sex these guys. Um, this is a female, this really short tail, the vents right there and vents right there. Very obvious. You can sex them when they're babies. You don't even have to. You can just glance at them and you know. And the reports of them in literature being uh, calm and 
docile, whereas does not apply. And these are pretty irascible, particularly the females. Uh, they do this. This is what they do most of the time when you open the cage or mess with them at all. And they hiss loudly and they don't sit on the hooks very well. They open their mouths, jump off the hooks and fly in the air, try to hit whatever is um, available. And that's a male on the left here. And you can see the tail is pretty long. And obviously here is a male and this female here. There's her vent and there's the male's vent right there. And these are uh, both uh, four-year-old animals. So they're, they're not very big at all, but um, they're already mature. And that's a pair copulating on exhibit. So inside those enclosures where uh, we can put heat lamps on the back of them, uh, we utilize the, um, actually these are Zillow bulbs and uh, this temperature here is a, gets up to 102 degrees. So we first uh, acquired a group in 2008 and they had uh, been trickling in a little bit if I remember right sometime around 2005 or so. Uh, some groups of them, some privates in, got them into the country and I uh, believe into Europe but we got them in uh, our first group in 2008. Uh, and then in 2011 of March, a female, uh, we had laid, had 12 slugs and then one full term dead. And then in August 14, uh, a female, that same female passed 11 slugs. And then the same female in 2015 um, gave birth to 12 young and one stillborn. And we did have, see the copulation of them several months before with a male that we'd been in. Uh, introducing her to and removing periodically prior to that. And then in December 2017, that same female passed uh, eight slugs. And then in January, the female, this, a different female, passed 21 slugs in one full term. Uh, and then that same female in 2013 passed 21. And in 14, the female, that same one, uh, had nine live babies and 20 slugs. And and then 13 live babies were born in September of 15 uh, from a different female. And then f four live babies in 2015 from that, diff that same female. So they're pretty small, but they're still quite beautiful when they're born. And I believe that was the first group that we had. And it's a bit of an obscure chart, growth chart, but it does represent over the years and the grams. So most of the uh, animals that we got um, early on were, were quite young, probably be a year, maybe a year or two old. So they started off way down here in the, in the 40 and up to 100 grams. Uh, and then this one was one that we acquired that was already a sub-adult. And this is one female um, that was from day one of feeding um, her chart all the way up to this is up to January. Um, so I know that this one female has eaten 72 times since we've had her, uh, starting from pinks and now is eating uh, sub-adult rats and is now gravid. She's four, a little over four years old now. So this is the pair that, uh, these are both four-year-old animals and so we know that they are mature at four years old. We just, we started seeing this four-year-old female, she was looking kind of fat and she hadn't been with a male because well, I, we're, I did not think she was mature. No one thought that she was mature yet because the adults are quite large, um, probably three times larger than the, these animals here. So uh, we did some ultrasounds and saw some, some follicles developing and uh, said, well, well, let's see. We got the same age male, put him in there, and it was pretty quick that the, he was responsive to that. So you can see she is pretty fat right there, and this is now in May, so things are starting to go and growing and changing because we've been following her on with ultrasounds frequently just to, to see, just watch the development. Um, this is all pretty new for this species, so we'll have a lot of data on that. This is supposed to be a video, but it doesn't play. But um, So this is part of our handling of venomous snakes that we tube them, uh, get, coax them into the tube. Anytime we're doing medical procedures or handle them, if we need to sex them or anything we have to do hands-on, uh, we tube them uh, and uh, they can be safely handled that way.
So this was you're getting an X-ray or an ultrasound or both for one of the vipers. This was the first when we first thought, oh, well, she's in really fat, and might as well check it out and see. So you can see you can see some stuff going on there. It's pretty obvious. And then in March, this, that one was in February. So then in March, a couple weeks later, things are changing a bit. And then in May, this is after that we had introduced them because we did uh, introduce them March 16th, I believe is when that copulation took place. These, these, they're starting to change and look much different now. So we're doing this regularly. We don't like to take gravid animals and handle them a lot, but this is pretty interesting. We're trying to, we want to follow it and, and um, get as much data as we can on it. So there's a fang. They pass them like uh, all vipers do. They pass them in their feces or else they fall out or so we see them in the cages all the time. Uh, so we actually can come up with a way to clean cages with PVC gloves because of punctures to fingers if you're cleaning it around in there. Um, they, they're incredibly sharp. Uh, so they lose them all the time. They're regrowing them all the time because they have to be sharp because they depend on them for survival. So um, we find them all the time. We're, they're just, they're, you can see them from outside the exhibit sometimes in the, in the main viper exhibit just laying on a rock. So sometimes they're really white, which you wonder, what well, did it just fall out? And then sometimes they're really brown and then they're in the feces or they're next to the feces. So you're pretty sure they came out in, the, in fecal, but when they're really white and they're just laying on the side somewhere, it, it, you don't know if they fell out or if they, how they, if they passed them. And then that's a, the pup adder fang, so you can see the similarities. And that's some Bale Mountain. So there's the new snake uh, that they've found there. Uh, most of you, many of you may have seen as of recent that I believe it's 2013 and they started looking into it more and more and then the paper came out in 2016 uh, with photos and but this is the Bale Mountains and Herena National Forest. So this is this animal and it's definitely a different animal. So um, this is the only photos that I've seen of them, of, this, of the wild ones. Any questions from anybody? Thanks a lot. And um, with the, really, it's the keeper staff that we have, and staff here, Brandon and, and Rachel, they work with these animals and they do all the tough stuff and uh, make all this stuff happen and collect all the data and take all the notes. Anybody have any questions? Thank you, Brett, for your time. Thank you, everybody else. If you wanted to have some questions for Brett, you got to attend one of the next Herbiton talks. The next one is scheduled. Link is down in the description where you can find it. Next week, we are going to be chatting with Mr. Dan Maliri, a staple here on Sherpa Bee TV. And as Dan always does, he's going to bring us some really cool animals to look at and check out. Hope to see you next week. Until then, you've been watching Sherpa Bee TV. Y'all take care.